and I'll just begin with questions. Uh, and I'll start uh, with Ms. Jacobson. Uh, Mexico, as, as I know you believe and understand, is an important friend and ally in dealing with a wide range of bilateral and hemispheric issues. We share uh, close cultural and economic and security ties with them. And that's why I think all Americans are very concerned about the events of this past week. On Saturday, their most notorious drug lord, Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, broke out of a high security prison on Saturday night for the second time, escaping in a tunnel built right under his cell despite, according to press reports, the Mexican authorities having been warned by the DEA as early as 2014 about his escape plans. So given this and given El Chapo's history of escape, his reported limitless, limitless resources, and the known corruption within the justice system in parts of Mexico. Do, are you aware of the, the Department of Justice formally submitted an extradition request to the Department of State for El Chapo Guzman? Can say Your microphone, I'm sorry. Sorry, You're Mr. Chairman. Hearings, I, should, so you were... I should know better. <laughs> um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and, and thank you for your good wishes on my son. I greatly appreciate that. Um, we are incredibly frustrated and disappointed by the escape of Chapo Guzman. Um, we obviously, along with the Mexican government, uh, will work with, in support of the Mexican government to recapture him as quickly as possible. Um, what I can say is that obviously um, we are always interested in the extradition of criminal suspects in other countries who face charges in the United States, and there were pending charges against Joaquin Chapo Guzman in the United States. Um, in further detail, I can't get into in terms of pending or possible extradition matters. Those are matters uh, that the Justice Department would have to respond to. But we can say that we are always interested in the extradition of those who face multiple serious crimes in the United States. Let me switch to another topic. According to the International Christian Concern and Christian Solidarity Worldwide, religious intolerance frequently characterized by violence and forced displacement are common in the states of Oaxaca, Guerrero, Puebla, Hidalgo, and Chiapas. These religious freedom groups have pointed out that state government officials tasked with dealing with these kinds of issues and cases often have little or no training in human rights or religious freedom leading to the proliferation of these types of abuses in violation of Mexico's constitution. So if confirmed, will you prioritize the issue of religious freedom and tolerance in Mexico? And what approach will you take to engage the Mexican government on the state and federal levels to support efforts to train government officials on religious freedom and other basic human rights and upholding the, the rule of law? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And certainly I would make that a priority as I think it is one for this administration. I do think that we appreciated your um, staff bringing these cases to our attention. The embassy has already raised these issues at the federal and state level, and I would certainly prioritize continuing to do so uh, with the Mexican government as well as with civil society organizations. All right. I, before I pivot to one of the other nominees, I wanted to briefly uh, discuss your existing record of service to our country. Uh, by examining for a moment the Venezuela Defense of Human Rights and Civil Society Act of 2014, which imposed targeted sanctions on persons responsible for the violation of human rights, for the violation of the human rights of anti-government protesters in Venezuela. As you know, the President eventually signed this bill into law. Could you tell us a little bit about your role in the administration's decision-making about the implementation of this legislation, specifically which individuals would be sanctioned, et cetera? What role did you play in, in that process? In the process of uh, developing um, the names that would be sanctioned under that um, law, and remember we're talking about two kinds of sanctions, as you well know, of course, both visa sanctions and financial sanctions. Visa sanctions uh, we had already at the time of the passage of the law, and subsequently we have sanctioned a total of, I believe, 62 Venezuelan individuals, um, and those names were generated by a combination of various offices within the interagency community as well as our embassy in uh, Caracas. Um, the same process is used for the uh, list that is developed uh, for financial sanctions working in particular with the Treasury Department uh, as well as other entities of the U.S. government. And as those names are developed, the Assistant Secretary is not in the position of actually 
reviewing and saying, you know, particular names should go on or off, but a name, a, a list is presented after the interagency has come up with the most uh, information they can on candidates. So I did see the list of names once it had been developed by the interagency community. In specific, the Diosdado Cabello, who's the president of the National Assembly of Venezuela, and perhaps the most corrupt individual in Venezuela, which is a very high mark, um, was not included in that in that list. Is there any insight you can provide as to why he was not included? I, I really can't. Um, I know that there is a standard of, of information that is reviewed, um, and whether someone is on the list or not on the list depends on the kind of information that various agencies may have. Uh, so I can't say why his name would or would not be on the list when that list would come to me or others to approve it. Thank you. If I'm pronouncing this correctly, is it Dogu? Or? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Thank you. I just want to make sure I didn't mess it up the first time I said it. So thank you for your service to our country and for your willingness to continue to serve. I wanted to ask you your thoughts on the potential of a canal that would act similarly to the Panama Canal and connect the Pacific Ocean and the Caribbean Sea through Nicaragua. What are the potential economic and environmental impacts this project can bring to the area? Thank you for your question, Mr. Chairman. I have been following the situation with the canal as I've been preparing for this hearing today. Uh, clearly, the United States government is interested in that and there are potentially large economic and environmental impacts. We are concerned with the lack of transparency as this project has been moving forward at this point and we are watching that very, very carefully. At this point, we actually do not see that there are sufficient funds to start the construction of the canal at this time. There have been no investors identified other than one individual, and we're not sure how that's going to play out. But if confirmed, I will continue to monitor that situation carefully. If you're confirmed, uh, I'm sure you're aware that there's a number of outstanding property claims from United States citizens against the Nicaraguan government. Uh, if confirmed, what will be your strategy or your approach to helping these claims uh, that U.S. citizens currently have against that government? Thank you, sir. Yes, uh, I have been monitoring that situation as well. The 527 claim situation is actually in a very good position at this time. It appears that we may be close to resolving the last of those cases for the continuous claimants. Those are people who were U.S. citizens at the time their property was confiscated. There are, however, uh, still many other cases of people who have become U.S. citizens since their property was confiscated. And if confirmed, I will continue to work on this through the U.S. Embassy, both through uh, support through consular operations and through our property office at the Embassy. But there has been good progress made in that area, and I will continue to work with the government of Nicaragua to ensure that we continue to move that forward. Mr. Holloway, after the recent discovery of oil off the coast of Guyana, the Venezuela's made territorial claims into the Caribbean Sea, including the oil field discovery, which already belongs to Guyana. So what is the U.S. policy, what is our current U.S. policy towards, with regards to this dispute between Venezuela and Guyana? Thank you, sir. Um, in spite of an 1899 decision which granted most of the territory in dispute to Guyana, um, Venezuela has historically maintained claims to different parts, up to 67 percent of Guyana and parts of the, the coastline. Our po policy so far to date as we have been, as we have in many other disputes like this, have encouraged both countries to seek out a peaceful resolution, whether it be by the UN or any other appropriate international fora. But at the same time, any country that makes claims, they still have to respect the, the rule of the sea and other international obligations. So we are monitoring it very closely. The Venezuelans put out another statement very recently which replaced us, one that had been done a few weeks ago. We're still trying to analyze that and understand it better, but we are encouraging both sides to reach a peaceful resolution. Thank you. And Mr. Moraine, uh, in the 2004 Trafficking in Persons Report, Haiti was listed as a Tier 2 watch list for trafficking. The majority of Haiti's cases were identified as children in domestic servitude. We discussed that a moment ago in a previous hearing. I think you had a chance to watch some of that. Uh, Haiti's been granted a waiver from being placed on a Tier 3 because it had a written plan which would make significant steps towards combating trafficking. How would you assess the implementation of their plan to combat trafficking at this point? 
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, as, as you stated, 2014 was a, a good year on paper for Haiti regarding trafficking in persons. There was a passage of the anti-trafficking legislation and they created a plan for uh, 2000, the next two years, 2015 to 17, for implementing it. Um, at the moment, they have begun to take positive steps and they have set up what looks like a whole of government approach, but the, the proof of it will be in their execution. At this point, the execu execution is nascent. I think the government has an understanding of the, serious of the situation, seriousness of the situation, but at this point, um, we are waiting to see them take the serious steps. As with so many other issues in Haiti, it is a question both of capacity, having, having the institutional capacity, whether it's with the police, even the NGOs, and the institutional capacity to deal with these, the judicial capacity to prosecute, but it's also, sir, a question of political will, and we are hoping, as with many other things, that after the upcoming elections, we will have a president and a parliament in place that will be willing to put the political will into some of these difficult issues. The trafficking for domestic servitude is one of the issues that receives a tremendous amount of attention, but there's also been extensive media reporting over the last few years of children being sold into sex slavery, including in makeshift brothels that exist on the border region with the Dominican Republic. Uh, how familiar are you with that? What's the status of that over the last five years? And uh, would that be a priority for our embassy in Port-au-Prince uh, if confirmed? Well, let me start off by saying that if confirmed, it would absolutely be a priority, as I believe it already is for, for the embassy in Port-au-Prince. Um, I'm not familiar with the current details of the trafficking on the border area. Um, we have, however, taken significant steps in terms of our assistance programs, both on supporting civil society to both rec to do awareness raising and advocacy, as well as to deal with the victims of trafficking. We're also working with the government of Haiti to increase capacity in identifying awareness. There are a number of issues that have been stalled by the current political impasse of the last two years, but we will give it our utmost to move this issue forward. And that, as you know, cholera has already taken the lives of eight, over 8,900 Haitians and infected about 744,000 of them. Uh, giving the disturbing, new, the disturbing new spike in cases of cholera in Haiti, what initiatives is the U.S. undertaking or will the U.S. undertake to help address this ongoing epidemic? Thank you, Senator. The, um, the incidence of, of cholera has seen a, a recent spike, but this is after a 92 percent reduction in the cases in the last couple of years. The, the United States has put $95 million into a program of activities that has both been to deal with the immediate response to the cholera cases, but in some ways even more importantly, to build into the national health system the ability to deal with cholera and in the future other communicable diseases. We do believe we coordinate closely with other donors and we do believe that the situation, while troubling given the recent increase, is not out of control. Well, let me ask you, what will the United States do to ensure that the United Nations is held accountable for those already harmed by the disease? Well, so the United Nations, in response to the, the cholera outbreak, has been heavily engaged in the response through the World Health Organization and others. They are in a position as the coordinator of a lot of assistance activities to ensure that the follow-through um, reduces cholera to a point where it is as close to zero as can be. Um, I await the arrival of my colleagues, so I'll just keep going for a little while. <laughs> uh, the, I wanted to return to Mexico for a moment, uh, Ms. Jacobson. Uh, a lot of Americans, there's been a lot of discussion over the last few weeks and months about the state of affairs in Mexico. I think Mexico has a lot to be optimistic about. One of the things that people are concerned about, I certainly have been watching it both from this committee and from the Intelligence Committee, is the notion that there are regions in the northern part of Mexico that are not fully in the control of their government, that in essence criminal groups act de facto, uh, control these areas, and uh, in particular one of the groups that uh, is controlled by this uh, 
horrific individual who was able to escape uh, in the last few days and poses a threat to the United States and to his own people. Um, uh, I would just take an aside to say there's, you know, I've seen some chatter over the last few days that I think clearly understate who it is we're dealing with here in this individual, El Chapo. He's a murderer, uh, a person who's involved in virtually every nefarious activity one can imagine, including kidnapping, uh, murders, uh, and crimes committed within the United States facilitated by his organization. How would you describe the challenges the Mexican government faces in terms of providing security and stability, particularly in those areas where perhaps they don't have uh, effective control over their territory uh, as, as they would desire to have? I think, Mr. Chairman, that I would, on, in the first place, I think I would want to associate myself entirely with your characterization of, of Chapo Guzman. Um, to minimize his role or the horror of what he has wrought with the Sinaloa cartel, I think would do a disservice to his victims um, and to people who have been touched by the, the trafficking and the violence that the group has wrought. Um, clearly, the government and the people of Mexico face a very complicated and a very difficult security situation. It is much more difficult in about a half a dozen states in the country than elsewhere. It is not nationwide. Um, that is where the majority of the homicides take place, the majority of the drug violence, the majority of the territorial control between and among cartels. Um, it is important to remember, I think, that during the congressional and gubernatorial elections that took place uh, a little over a month ago, I guess, just about a month ago, um, 99% of polling stations opened and operated normally around the country, even in some of those places that have had high levels of violence. So they were able to undertake uh, the elections and people were able to vote freely, even in places where you had rumors that they wouldn't be able to exercise their votes. So I think that the notion that they have lost control of their territory, while clearly they are under siege in some places and there are places where people are fearful of local authorities, and local authorities themselves are part of the problem, not part of the solution. Um, I think that there are a number of places where it's been turned around, uh, where the Mexican government at the local, state, and federal level have been able to gain back that control, and that's what the Mexican government continues to work on, and we in support of them. Places like Ciudad Juarez in Chihuahua which for a time was really a no-go area and really has been coming back with levels of violence that have dropped. My colleague here served in Juarez during a very difficult time as a great leader in our consulate. Um, so I do think that continuing to get, um, to continue to work on the institutions of government to make sure that they're transparent on anti-corruption mechanisms as the Mexican Congress has just passed is critical to getting a handle on the full gamut of security problems they face. Another issue that, of course, is well documented in the United States is the migratory issues that we faced across the border. Uh, perhaps what many people are not as aware of uh, over the last few years is the trends now have a growing number of people who are crossing the U.S. southern border, the Mexican northern border, are not from Mexico. In particular, we've seen a large upsurge of people migrating from the northern triangle countries, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, uh, where is the opportunities, for, first of all, what is the uh, approach of the Mexican government at this stage to the reality that you now have people pushing up through the country from their southern border? And where are the opportunities to work cooperatively with them on both sides of the border uh, to seal off uh, the opportunities to transit illegally, which in fact is a magnet for more people to attempt to do it? Absolutely, and I think it's a very important question, Senator. Um, you know, I think... Last year's surge in migrants from Central America uh, was an important kind of bellwether, uh, not just for the United States in how we are focused on Central America and the root causes of such migration, but also for Mexico, which had seen migrants move through its territory for a long time, but not in those kinds of numbers. In the last year, the numbers coming into the United States have dropped dramatically, but a big part of that has been um, the Mexican effort to reduce the number of people coming into Mexico at their southern border um, and to also reduce some of the most dangerous 
um, practices uh, that are being uh, affected on migrants, such as riding on uh, the, the infamous train north, La Bestia, and shutting that down so that migrants can't be exploited violently in that trip north, including uh, unaccompanied minors. So we have worked very closely with Mexico on this, including on their southern border strategy, um, devoting resources, training, um, so that they can help both gain control over their southern border with Guatemala, with new task forces, working with the Northern Triangle countries, and then obviously working uh, with Mexico, but also with the Northern Triangle countries on the root causes that are causing the migrants to flee in the first place. Okay, thank you, uh, Senator Flake. Thank you, and we're gonna, unless more members come, we're gonna reach our conclusion here fairly soon, which I'm sure none of you will be offended if you're not the subject of a lengthy uh, hearing, but I did have some questions I wanted to touch base. Some are a little bit broader. I, I did want to revisit for a moment Venezuela. Uh, Ms. Jacobson, I cut short my questioning because I wanted to get to all of the nominees. Are you, uh, and I'm not saying that, I'm, that this is something that I've been told, I'm just curious and, and I think it's important for the record. Are you aware of any assurances that Councilor Shannon or any U.S. official made, uh, including persons in the White House or the NSC, uh, to representatives of the Venezuelan government that the United States is going to refrain from applying additional sanctions on human rights violators or, or corrupt persons. Have any such assurances been made by anybody that you're aware of in the U.S. government? To the That's my leaders? knowledge, no. Okay. Um, I want to get to like a, a broader, that may involve the number of the countries involved, but particularly Nicaragua and, and Mexico. As we look at the Western Hemisphere, there's a two competing camps that seem to have emerged, at least in my view, and I'd love to have your comment on it. The one is kind of the pro-American, uh, I should say, but friendlier to our interests camp of nations. And you see prosperity in these countries. Of course, Peru and Chile, Colombia, uh, Panama, and I would include Mexico in that group of, of countries that are a key part of a kind of prosperous future for the Western Hemisphere, all of which have made substantial gains. They still have challenges. Colombia has significant challenges. Mexico, we've talked about some of their challenges as well. And then there's the second group that's emerged, and they, on the other hand, are heading in the opposite direction in many respects. Uh, obviously, Cuba for a long time, but Venezuela, uh, Bolivia, Ecuador, and oftentimes Nicaragua is in that camp as well. And so let me begin by, and I don't want to make your job any harder than it's going to be confirmed, but I do have serious questions, I think most many of us do, about the legitimacy of the elections that they've conducted there in the past and the general attitude of the Nicaraguan government towards the United States of America. On the one hand, they do allow U.S. investment of U.S. firms and companies. There's travel there and there's engagement in that sense. On the other, their government is less than cooperative on a host of issues. And in fact, they have now expressed a willingness, for example, to allow the, the Russians to uh, increase uh, military cooperation with them and even pay ex increased number of port visits, et cetera. How, Ms. Dogu, how would you describe our relationship with Nicaragua today? Is Nicaragua, obviously they're not a uh, an ally in the traditional sense of the word, but how, how would you describe our current situation when it comes to their government versus the United States and the relationship between us at this moment? Mr. Chairman, I think you actually described it quite well. It's a very complex relationship. Uh, we do have some stresses in the relationship, but we also do have areas that we're able to cooperate quite well together. Um, on the stress side, obviously we're concerned about some of the things that you mentioned in terms of the lack of uh, free elections and the lack of space for people in the country to have a dialogue about the, the choice that they would have for leaders of their country. On the economic side, however, we cooperate well. We are their number one trading partner. Uh, they are part of the Central America Free Trade Agreement. Uh, since they joined the Central America Free Trade Agreement and that went into effect, uh, their trade with the United States has increased by about 165%. Uh, trade from the United States to Nicaragua has also increased fairly significantly. Interestingly, even on the law enforcement side and on the counter-narcotic side, we've been able to find an opportunity to work together. Uh, on the counter-narcotic side, we do have cooperation with uh, the government of Nicaragua, a, a small funding that goes to them through the Department of Defense and through DEA. Um, and so we do have some areas of cooperation on the law enforcement side. Uh, they have actually uh, removed from their country two fugitives that were on the FBI top 10 list last year in 2014. So I think the challenge for me, if I'm confirmed, sir, will be to continue to find those areas that we can cooperate together and to go ahead and work very carefully and closely to address the areas of concern where we do not get along so well. And I can commit to you that I will do that and it will be a high priority for me if confirmed. And then Ms. Jacobson on the issue of, of 
Uh, let me just first ask you about the broader region, and I described these sorts of competing camps that have emerged. Um, Mexico, I think, is a key linchpin to that. I mean, it, it, my recollection, they are, if not the largest, among the, the largest economies in the region, um, certainly in comparison to some of the smaller countries. Um, they've always also had a significant influence in the, in the multinational organizations that characterize the region. As Mexico continues to grow and prosper, and, and do you view them as a nation, as a government willing to play more in the regional leadership category? Are they prepared, for example, to play a greater role in what's happening with human rights violations and you know, elections that are upcoming in Venezuela? Are they prepared to address some of the challenges that are being faced to their south, which they're impacted by in the, in the Northern Triangle countries? How, how would you uh, characterize their willingness to become a more active participant as a regional leader, uh, which is really their, their role in that region, rightfully? Um, I think that's, that's an incredibly important point for Mexico. You know, Mexico for many, many years had a very, very strong role in, um, especially on the economic side with Central America. I think to some extent uh, during Venezuela's heyday of high oil prices in Petrocaribe, Mexico was pushed out of that sphere a little bit. They have reasserted their engagement on Central America. They've reasserted it on economic issues and greater engagement with the Central American countries. They've reasserted it on energy, which is extremely positive. Um, there are gas pipelines being built between Mexico and Guatemala. We know that Energy prices in Central America are as much as 10 times higher than they are in the United States. This affects their productivity and all of the other ills that we see reflected in migration. So Mexico's greater engagement with Central America and its leadership there is critical. Um, but beyond that, I think they can play more of a role. Um, Mexico, as it opened up and began to be more confident as a democracy, opening up to UN human rights organizations and the inter-American human rights organization system needs also to play that role regionally. Um, there are Mexican members of the inter-American human rights commission now and it would be great if Mexico felt more confident in playing that role regionally with South American countries or elsewhere. But I also think it's significant beyond regionally that uh, President Peña Nieto talked about Mexicans being involved in peacekeeping for the first time when he was at the UN General Assembly last fall. That's another place where I think Mexico can begin to make a contribution and in leadership, including in the region. The general state of affairs in Mexico, I mean, we've obviously for years, uh, some have viewed Mexico as a, a source of uh, cheaper labor, as a place where businesses move operations because it might be less costly to do business there as a source of migration to the United States in massive numbers. Uh, but over the last few years, though, all those factors have begun to change. Uh, in fact, there's an emerging middle class in Mexico now with significant consumer power. Um, and there are in significant pockets of prosperity emerging within parts of Mexico as they help continue to try to make this transition to a more prosperous future. How would you describe the state of affairs in Mexico today? Is it a country headed in the right direction? Is it a, obviously with significant challenges? Is it a country that remains the way I just characterized, uh, that some view it as a, as a place that, uh, because, for example, as we've seen in some reports, net migration from Mexico significantly declined, partially, I would imagine, due to uh, the economic downturn in the United States, but also partially, if not, in, in, if not primarily, due to the fact that now there are income and uh, employment opportunities in Mexico today that didn't exist. So what are the drivers of this growth, and what do they need to do next to continue those trends? I think there's a number of things. Um, one, to be honest, is out of their control, and that's demographics. The Mexican population is aging to some extent, as the U.S. population has, and we know that people don't migrate um, beyond a certain age. Uh, in terms of illegal migration uh, or undocumented migration. But the other is that the Mexican government has been extremely focused, as was the Calderon administration, on education. Um, and that's crucial to them sustaining the movement of large numbers of people into that middle class. Um, and they know that w as we work on education jointly and we've expanded our educational cooperation dramatically, Last year, there were hundreds of Mexican teachers who came to the United States for advanced English study to go home and teach English in Mexico. Um, this is part of the President's 100,000 Strong in the Americas, 
and a, a joint program, bilateral program with Mexico that we've launched. And I think, you know, we're looking at ways to improve the educational exchanges, but not just at the very high top four-year level. Mexico has developed a series of Politecnicos, which are more akin to vocational training or community colleges, to really educate and train the gap between those who go through K through 12, uh, but aren't necessarily going to go to a four-year university, but get involved in manufacturing jobs that now require more than just a high school education in Mexico as well. And I think that's really the focus of Mexico, is on education moving forward, because I would agree with the first characterization you gave as Mexico as an increasingly, I guess it was the second one, an increasingly middle class country with really important pockets of progress that need to be expanded to the rest of the country. Um, and, and the passage of economic and structural reforms that this administration passed in Mexico in its first year in office are really critical, but now they have to implement those reforms and keep moving forward with education um, and with fiscal reforms and telecommunications and energy opening to provide the kinds of jobs that will continue the growth for both our economies. Well, you signal demographic trends in Mexico, and it's an interesting point. Their, their immigration policies are much more stringent than ours. That's correct. It's a lot, in essence, it's a lot easier to immigrate legally to the United States than it is to immigrate legally to Mexico in terms of um, and so the question then is, uh, do they now, uh, on the issue of migration as they continue to uh, develop in this direction, is it your sense that this is a country more willing, a government, more willing to cooperate the United States with the United States to stem the flow of illegal migration across their northern border than they were five or ten years ago? There is a sense among some um, that I partially share that because of the high level of remittances, from the United States back to Mexico, that there's been an interest in the past in not discouraging migration as, as a source of, of uh, remittances back to the United States. But is there now a sense that for the first time in, in a while, the Mexican government is trying, starting to realize increasingly that the instability on their northern border is attracting migration on their southern border and on their coasts and present security challenges to Mexico, not just to the United States, and if so, do you think now there is an opportunity to work even closer with them to establish uh, the sorts of improvements we need on both sides of the border uh, to, to solidify that situation further? What I can say, Mr. Chairman, is I think that the Mexican government does realize the threat to the, um, the threat to both the economic situation and to the border, both northern and southern, um, that undocumented or uncontrolled migration creates, both from other people using Mexican territory to traverse to come to the United States, as well as Mexicans entering the United States undocumented. I think the cooperation has been really quite good in recent years, but I will say that it has been amped up recently. Um, and there is a real sense in Mexico, I think, that as others use their territory to try and get to the U.S. and their own economic situation improves, they could decide to stay in Mexico. And so it is in their interest to work on orderly and safe and legal migration with protections for people, of course, um, the same way it is for us. <coughs> um, my final question, because we're nearing 5 o'clock, Again, for you, Ms. Jacobson, we may, we may not see you again in the, your current capacity before the committee. I wanted to talk, I know you've been involved in the negotiations that ultimately have led to the announcement of mutual embassies in Washington and in Havana. Uh, ironically, just a few days after that announcement was made, and I think the Sunday after our, the 5th of July, there were once again mass detentions in Havana, the ladies in white. There was a, one uh, peaceful demonstrator who had his nose fractured and beaten. And it goes back to the situation about this embassy. What kind of embassy are we going to have in Havana? And the thing I've been deeply concerned about is that it will not, and I know that the argument has been, well, we're going to have an embassy in Havana the way we do in other countries that have un, un, uh, unfriendly governments uh, in that approach. But I, but I do think if we're, we have now taken this massive step, the president has, of diplomatically recognizing that government as a legitimate form of government, at least, in, uh, although we certainly have qualms about how they operate, the president has given them diplomatic recognition and opened this embassy. 
What kind of embassy is this going to be? It appears to me from what's been announced that the employees of that embassy, other than the American diplomatic employees, the people that clean, the people that do the service work, will always continue to be hired from an, from an agency controlled by the Cuban government. Uh, it's my understanding that there will continue to be a significant security perimeter that could discourage people from coming to the embassy to appeal for assistance from the United States. It appears that all but two members of that, uh, and maybe I'm wrong about the number, but there would be significant limitations on the ability of U.S. diplomats to use the embassy to travel throughout the country and engage with people. And there apparently will be significant limitations on the ability to deliver enhancements to the technological capabilities of that facility. So in essence, what, other than the name on the door, what will be different about this facility than the interest section that we have there now? Thank you, Senator. Um, it was very important as we discussed this opening of embassies and reestablishment of diplomatic relations, that we be absolutely certain that we can do our jobs under the Vienna Convention as we see them, which include being able to get out into the country and talk to people, um, certainly more than just two people, but, but others within the embassy, and that we ensure that the embassy is a place that people can come to, Cubans can come to, because Americans have never really had di great difficulty if they're in, in Cuba. Um, and I can assure you that what we will be doing and the way we will be operating is significantly different than we have been operating in as, as an interest section. The security presence outside the interest section has already been reduced, um, and the agreement on that is a significant reduction in security presence outside the future embassy such that we hope people will not feel nearly the same kind of presence or threat, and there will no longer be Cuban government screening or names taken for people to enter the U.S. Embassy. That will be something, as we do all over the world, that we do, not the host government. Um, the ability to travel is similar to our restrictions in many other places around the world. Um, there are a number of people at the embassy who will be able, it's, it's more than two as a matter of fact, um, who will be able to travel without any pre-notification, but others will be able to travel on a certain number of days notification, but they will no longer have to ask permission. And that's quite significant because we previously had to ask for approval. Now it is only a notification, and then we go. So that is really quite significant in enabling us to get out and travel. Um, and we also have had almost no ability to get sensitive shipments into our, uh, to our interest section. They had all but stopped. And we have made a very good start on reprovisioning the interest section. And we'll continue to have talks thereafter about future shipments. So in many of the ways, all of the ways that we laid out that were important to us to begin to operate more like every place else that, that is a restrictive environment, we made enormous progress from where we are now. Okay. Well, I want to thank all the witnesses uh, for all of the nominees for being here with us today. I appreciate it um, very much. Uh, and your patience in the back and forth of people coming in and out. And um, again, uh, we look forward to continuing to review your nominations. You, you may receive uh, written questions and follow-ups from members of the committee, and I encourage you to promptly respond to those as, as quickly as possible since uh, a delay in that response could delay uh, a final vote and consideration by the Senate. So again, I want to thank all of you for your service to our country and for your willingness to continue to serve. And with that, the committee stands adjourned. I apologize. The reminder that the record will be open until Friday at the end of the business day. Thank you. The committee is adjourned.